Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees. Here are today's top stories. The Shadow Foreign Secretary says the UK needs to be more clear-eyed on Chinese investment. It comes as the influential China Research Group recommends reviewing Beijing's connections to UK universities. Petrol panic buying continues. The government has put the army on standby to deliver fuel and continues to face calls to let key workers have priority access to fuel supplies. And researchers found dangerous levels of the drugs cocaine and ecstasy in White Lake River when Glastonbury Festival was held nearby in 2019. Labour Shadow Foreign Secretary Lisa Nandy says the UK needs to be more clear-eyed about the risks of Chinese investment, a line also taken by some influential politicians in the Conservative Party. Here's Entity's Jane Worrell with this report. MPs from both benches have concerns over the Chinese Communist Party's human rights record, and Boris Johnson has previously raised concerns over Chinese investment. But at the Labour Party conference, the Shadow Foreign Secretary says the UK needs to be more clear-eyed on investment from Beijing. In an interview with Reuters, she says that while investment shouldn't totally be stopped, key industries need to be protected. But it's easy for an opposition party to say that while they're not in power. Do you think it's something that the Labour Party would keep their word on? I think it's something that the Labour Party will keep its word on. You're right, it's easy for oppositions to, to talk tough because they're not actually having to deal with the Chinese government on, on things like climate change, for example. And we've certainly seen, seen Labour take a strong stance on issues like Xinjiang and Hong Kong, which is to be welcomed. Um, in terms of the comments that Lisa Nandy made about infrastructure, I think, if anything, she's sort of um, reflecting what is a growing consensus in the UK, even on you know, the government benches. I think the, the the Conservative government is seeking to reverse this kind of golden era um, uh, narrative and, uh, and uh, a situation where we had you know increasing Chinese investment in important national national infrastructure like nuclear power. Um, so I don't think what she's saying is necessarily unrealistic, and I think it's glad it's a good thing that we've got a consensus in this country. Uh, as for your point about whether Labour should will stick to it. I think the, the shadow uh, front bench foreign affairs team are, are pretty united on this. Um, Keir Starmer has been pretty clear in his support for AUKUS, our new uh, deal with the Australians and the, uh, the Americans, which I think further embeds us in the Indo-Pacific. And Lisa Nandy's come out in favour of it. There was a bit of backlash at the party conference with delegates voting against AUKUS, calling it you know, a dangerous threat to stability in the Indo-Pacific. But... Um, that they appear to be a, a minority voice uh, within the Labour Party. These comments come as the influential China research group wrote a report. In it, it recommends that the UK review Beijing's connections to its universities. It says these connections should be recorded in a doomsday book. It's documented that partnerships between Chinese firms and British universities play a role in developing the Chinese Communist Party's military and weapons. The China Research Group of Conservative MPs was set up by the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Tom Tugendhat. They're also calling for the UK to develop and publish a UK-China strategy. Jane Warrell, NTG News, London. Retailers warn the panic buying of petrol shows no sign of abating. Filling stations in many parts of the country continue to run dry today. NTD's Cost Terminus has more on this. Petrol panic buying shows no sign of ending despite the government putting the army on standby to deliver fuel. Long queues wind towards a petrol station in London. It was very hard. Early in the morning, I just got up and tried to go ask the fuel station empty, then two others empty. This is the fourth one, and I have no fuel. I'm, ne I'm nearly going to run east London, so I, I don't know how to make it. This delivery driver says he was driving around for two hours, but stations were empty or queues were too long. I can't believe it. It's crazy. It's, but it doesn't seem like this. They keep saying there's no shortage. But it's just kind of, everyone's, I suppose, everyone's panicking now. On Monday night, Business Secretary Kwasi Kwarteng announced army drivers will be on standby to deliver fuel if necessary. 75 drivers will be given additional tanker training with a further 75 available if required. 
Transport Secretary Grant Shapps authorized an extension to ADR driver licenses, allowing them to transport fuel. ADR drivers have a license to transport dangerous goods by road. They have to take a refresher training and pass an exam every five years, but this has been suspended. Oil companies say they expect pressure on forecourts to ease in the coming days, with many cars carrying more fuel than usual. But chairman of the Petrol Retailers Association Brian Madison says there is little sign of that happening and social media is driving the dash to the pumps. He tells the BBC as soon as a tanker arrives, people announce it on social media and everyone rushes to the station like bees to a honeypot. The supply will be out again within a few hours. Meanwhile, the government continues to face calls to let key workers have priority access to fuel supplies. British Medical Association warns essential services could be hit if staff are unable to get to work because they can't fill up. Costa Menes, NTD News. The fuel crisis is hitting those who drive for a living hard as they cannot get the petrol they need to work. We hear from a London taxi driver on how he is dealing with the situation. And it is Natalia Nutting has the story. The petrol crisis is making life very hard for London taxi drivers. This driver says half his colleagues can't work because they don't have enough fuel. Apart from the anxiety of um, not being able to work, on the back of um, 18 months of um, not knowing what's going on, uh, where, the, where the next job's coming from. We've just started to get some work and now we've been hit with this. Um, it's massive. Kirby has driven taxis in London for 30 years. He's not sure whether he can work tomorrow. The last 24 hours has been uh, three hours yesterday of driving around with limited fuel trying to find some. I eventually did at the ninth attempt, but I had to queue for nearly an hour and a half to get some, which, which was, means that I'm OK for the next day or so. Kirby says he will not only lose income, but his regular customers will also be affected. I do regular uh, school runs for special needs children, uh, hospital runs, and I've been having to phone them this morning to say that later in the week um, they might have to make other arrangements because I may be unable to work. Kirby hopes the government can draw up a priority list for fuel and taxi drivers can be on it. People that need fuel need fuel. There's a lot of people out there that, that don't need fuel and are, are taking it and that's causing a knock-on effect to the problem. But an essential users list is what's needed so that the garages can then can prioritise. The Licensed Taxi Drivers Association is also calling for essential user-only petrol stations. The organisation tells the standard up to a third of black cab drivers were not on the road on Monday as they didn't have enough fuel or feared would get stranded. Natalia Nutting, NTD News. A Department for Transport Investigation reveals that South Eastern Railway did not return £25 million of taxpayer money in a serious breach of its franchise agreement. The government will now be taking over their train services. Here's NTD's Malcolm Hudson with the details. The government is taking over South Eastern Railway's service operations after a serious breach of its franchise agreements. The Department for Transport has found that since October 2014, South Eastern Railway has not declared over £25 million of taxpayer money which should have been returned. Further investigations are being conducted into all related contract issues. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps said, the decision to take control of services makes unequivocally clear that we will not accept anything less from the private sector than a total commitment to their passengers and absolute transparency with taxpayer support. The government will transfer the running of services to their in-house management organisation from the 17th of October. In the future, the government says services will be moved back to the private sector on a new passenger services contract. Passengers will be reassured that there will be no changes to fares, tickets or services. All tickets will still be valid after the transfer, and new tickets can still be purchased in the usual way. Malcolm Hudson, Entity News, London. Young activists descended on Milan today as a week of climate talks kicked off with the Youth for Climate conference. Some 400 activists from more than 190 countries are expected to attend. Entity's Joy Duggett has more on this. 
Policymakers are asking youth activists to help come up with solutions relating to climate change ahead of the COP26 United Nations Summit in November. Swedish activist Greta Thunberg was among those attending an international youth climate summit, Youth for Climate, held in the Italian city of Milan on Tuesday. Opening the conference, Thunberg mocked British Prime Minister Boris Johnson by quoting parts of his speeches. There is no planet B. There is no planet blah. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. This is not about some expensive, politically correct, green act of bunny-hugging or blah, blah, blah. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. Other young people, inspired by Thunberg's fame and global attention, came to attend the conference. I'm really, really excited about having Greta at the event because she's a, an inspiration to very many young people worldwide. And um, I think she has done her part and she's still doing her part. And what I can say is that every young person, wherever, everywhere in the world, and I come from Uganda, I'm calling on all young people from Uganda, from African countries, that there's always something that you can do. The United Nations was offering fully funded tickets to people between the ages of 15 and 29 to attend. It was open to experienced climate activists as well as those without activist experience. Speakers made demands on world leaders. It's time to show us the money. It's time, it's time, it's time. And don't forget to listen to the most affected people and areas. Fears over climate change reached new heights after a United Nations report in August warned the global environmental situation was dangerously close to spiralling out of control. Children around the world are being encouraged to take part in climate activism. Last Friday, millions of children in multiple countries took part in a global climate change protest, with some taking a day off school to air their views on climate issues. Joy Dugid, NTD News. Scientists say environmentally damaging levels of illicit drugs have been found in the river running through the site of Glastonbury Festival. Researchers discovered levels of NDMA and cocaine in the water were so high it could be harming wildlife further downstream, including rare populations of eels. The measurements were taken before, during and after the Glastonbury Festival when it was last held in 2019. Researchers at Bangor University are concerned over the environmental impact of drug and pharmaceutical waste, calling it a potentially devastating pollutant. It is thought the drugs enter nearby rivers through public urination on the surrounding ground. Glastonbury organizers say they have worked hard to reduce this threat to the waterways through a number of campaigns and do not condone the use of illegal drugs at the festival. Still to come, more NATO troops in Kosovo are patrolling on the border with Serbia after Serbia deploys troops and tanks over a license plate dispute. That and more after the break. NATO troops stepped up patrols in Kosovo on Monday near border crossings with Serbia. This comes after Serbia deployed tanks and troops to the border as tensions soar between the two Balkan neighbours. Entities Eddie Aiken has more on this. The NATO-led K-4 mission in Kosovo increased its patrols on Monday on the border with Serbia. The aim is to de-escalate tensions between the two Balkan foes over a dispute about license plates. Serbia raised its military alert last week. It has deployed tanks and troops with military jets and helicopters flying close to the border with Kosovo. It's in response to Kosovo sending in special police to remove license plates from cars entering the country from Serbia. It's been seven days of these activities aimed only to raise tensions and threaten the Serbian people. That must be stopped. The situation has to return to how it was before. The license plate issue between the two neighbours is not so much about license plates, but about respecting each nation's sovereignty, so it has great symbolic power. Serbia, along with ally Russia, refuses to recognise Kosovo's independence as many Western nations have done. 
Kosovo Serbs have been blocking the border with trucks for a week. This after Kosovo decided to emulate Serbia and remove Serb license plates from cars coming into the country. Drivers must then buy temporary plates. Serbia has removed Kosovo plates from cars coming in since 2008. Last weekend, Kosovo government officials say a public building was set on fire and another was hit by grenades and what they described as criminal acts relating to the protest by ethnic Serbs. The EU has urged both sides to restraint. And the first positive step will be uh, the chief negotiators from both sides coming to Brussels to use the platform of the dialogue to to discuss the way forward, and the way forward means de-escalation, because this is not good. What is happening right now is not good for the people in Kosovo, not good for the people in Serbia, and also it's not good for the region. K4 is led by NATO, but is supported by the United Nations and the European Union. The aim of the 4,000 troop force is to stave off tensions between majority Kosovo Albanians and minority Kosovo Serbs after Kosovo became independent from Serbia in 2008. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Dozens of high school students got their COVID-19 jab at their school in Paris last week. This comes as France gears up to require teens to present a health pass for access to many public places. NTD's Joy Duguid has that story. From this Thursday, France will require all teenagers to show a health pass to enter places like restaurants, cinemas and cultural venues. They also will need one to ride long-distance buses, trains and planes. The health pass provides proof of vaccination, a negative PCR test or recent recovery from COVID-19. At a recent vaccination drive at a high school in Paris, more than 100 middle and high school students got jabbed. Today I'm vaccinated because... Today I'm getting vaccinated. First, to be able to once again go out to restaurants with my friends, to be able to have parties with friends, also to be able to travel, be it abroad or in France, and to be able to participate in outdoor activities. The looming deadline led to an uptick in vaccinations among the 12 to 17 year olds. 71% of French teenagers have now received at least one dose. Regular testing is not an option for many since tests are no longer free. Starting in June, France was one of the first countries to open up vaccinations to teens. Some teens are more afraid than others. I promise you, it doesn't hurt. David Martin, who manages the vaccination drive in the high school, says doctors do not have enough access to children and parents who have doubts about the vaccine. The assistant principal agrees. Why is it important to offer vaccinations in academic institutions? Because it largely simplifies the process for the students, who as soon as they turn above 16 could personally choose to come and get vaccinated. Those aged 12 to 15 need consent from their parents to get a shot. The health pass requirement for adults has been in place since August. It has been controversial. France has seen regular protests since July against the pass. Critics fear it is dividing society. Paris announced last week it is planning a bill to extend the possible use of the health pass into next year. Joy Duguid, NTD News. At least one person has died when an earthquake shook Greece's largest island, Crete, on Monday, injuring several others. Many buildings on the east of the island were damaged. A 5.8 magnitude earthquake shook Greece's largest island, Crete, on Monday, killing at least one person and injuring several, according to authorities. Damage was reported to many old buildings close to the epicenter in the east of the island. One man died when the dome of a small chapel in the town of Arkaloholi caved in during renovation works, according to a police official. The church was largely reduced to rubble. Stavros Kalayonakis is the rescue service chief. <laughs> The side walls were still standing, but the whole roof had collapsed and the rubble was one metre high. So we believed that hopes that the person would be alive were very slim. 
With the help of heavy machinery, we removed and emptied the rubble around and inside the church and reached the lifeless body of the poor worker underneath. The Greek infrastructure ministry said it had sent a group of civil engineers to assess the structural damage and assist in relief efforts. Civil protection authorities said nine people were injured in the quake, which damaged mainly old, unoccupied buildings in the wider Arkaraholi region. Still, many people in Crete's main city, Iraklion, some 20 miles away, rushed outdoors. A civil protection official said hotel rooms would be made available for people needing to stay outside of their homes overnight and 2,500 tents would also be put up. Google on Monday launched its bid at the second highest European court to appeal a record EU antitrust penalty. In 2018, the EU Commission fined Google £3.7 billion. The Commission argues through the dominance of its Android operating system, Google is stifling competition and reducing choices for consumers. The Californian company told a panel of five judges in Luxembourg on Monday that Android has led to lower-priced phones and spurred competition with its chief rival, Apple. The fine is the biggest Brussels has ever imposed for anti-competitive behavior. It is one of three antitrust penalties totaling almost £6 billion that the Commission hit Google with. Wild boars trotting along the streets of Rome have become a common sight. They rummage through bins and even chase people putting their rubbish out, heating up a major debate ahead of mayoral elections in early October. Here's NTD's Eddie Aiken with more on this. Residents in the Monte Mario region of Rome have to be careful of wild boars. Complaints say they are rummaging through bins and chasing people, putting out their rubbish. Local administrations have failed to implement effective management plans for the boars who come to the city to get food. With a family of 15 boars, it's a bit difficult because you get scared. Even walking to school, a normal thing for middle school kids, becomes something dangerous. Mayor Virginia Raggi is struggling to shift responsibility for the boars, as well as heaps of rubbish piling up in the city. The root of the problem is this. If there was not a garbage issue, then the animals would stay where they have always been. Mayor Raggi recently filed a suit against the Lazio region, saying it is up to the regional administration to solve the boar issue. The Lazio region says the management of animals outside parks is up to city councils. National Agricultural Association, Coldireti, says boars are also a problem in rural areas. The wild boar population today has risen above 2 million. COVID-19 made the phenomenon all the more evident because we abandoned our urban centers for a period. Mazzini says Italy's farmers lose over 170 million pounds a year in crops destroyed by hungry wild boars, and it caused a road accident every 48 hours in 2020, with 16 deaths. Animal rights groups are opposed to culling and suggest sterilizing the boars, then releasing them in protected parks. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. A fossil skull belonging to a giant hyena has been discovered in a cave in Ukraine. Scientists say it's a rare find and is the first discovery of a full giant hyena skull since the 1840s. And today's Natalia Nutting brings us more on this. A complete fossil skull of a giant hyena has been discovered in Crimea's Stavrida cave. The discovery may help to understand the evolution of the ancient species. In Russia, a finding like this was discovered before. The first complete skull of Pachekokruta, of similar age with a lower jaw, was discovered in Baikal. Giant hyena lived on Earth in the late Miocene epoch, between 5 and 7 million years ago. They became extinct 400,000 years ago. Ironically, the very first specimen found uh, which was discovered in the 1840s um, from a French site called Saint-Seine, uh, is actually more complete. So it, it is a complete skull. 
These rare finds give scientists a lot to work on. We will reconstruct the skull to make it visually more descriptive. But even now we can say that this will give us a more deep understanding of the evolution of peculiarities of the species. Are they close to the early species or more later ones that inhabited the late Pleistocene? According to Grimanov, the skull belongs to a hyena that came between late European hyenas and early Eurasian ones. Scientists say the Tavrida cave contains rich materials for understanding prehistoric periods. This cave served as a shelter for various predators. In various periods it was inhabited by Etruscan bears, two kinds of saber-toothed tigers, lynxes, wolves, jackals and hyenas. Research in the cave was initiated to understand the climate and natural environment of Crimea before the Great Ice Age. Natalia Nutting, NTD News. Divers have discovered treasure off the east coast of Spain. A university there announced last week that dozens of Roman coins were recovered near a small Spanish island. Two amateur freedivers first discovered eight coins back in August. Archaeologists later dove even further and returned with 45 more. The find is one of the largest collections of Roman coins in Europe. Scientists date the coins back between the 4th and 5th centuries and say they're perfectly preserved. That's the news for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees. Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on Channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on Channel 271. In the meantime though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.